Mormon Mental Health Podcast is a production of the Open Stories Foundation and relies on donations from its listeners like you. To help keep this podcast alive, please consider becoming a monthly subscriber. Any amount will make a difference. You can click the right-hand donate button on mormonmentalhealth.org. All contributions are tax-deductible within the United States and go towards podcast production and building community support and program development for Mormons on various paths and journeys. Thank you for listening. Hello, and welcome to Mormon Mental Health Podcast. This is Natasha Helfer-Parker, and uh, today we are interviewing um, several of the providers at Symmetry Solutions in regards to the recent changes in what women and men are saying during the scripts presented during temple worship, uh, which have become more egalitarian in their presentation. So we're really excited about this topic. Uh, Before I go there and introduce who our guests are, um, I just do want to give a reminder that we are starting a new fiscal year, 2019. I want to give a huge shout out and thank you for all the people that have, um, you know, uh, helped by becoming donors and, um, have donated to Mormon mental health in the past. I cannot do this podcast without those donations. So thank you so much. Just so that you know, I have to raise a minimum of 5,000 a year to make it barely cover its costs. And if I really want to pay everyone who helps me edit and, you know, all the costs that come just in the podcast and also of course, you know, pay myself for my time, that would be closer to like a $10,000 mark. And um, the most effective way for me to receive donations are uh, monthly subscribers and donors. So I kind of know what to expect for month to month. But of course, I welcome any one-time donation as well. This is part of the Open Stories Foundation. It is a nonprofit and therefore uh, it's all tax deductible, at least here in the United States. And any amount is really helpful. I mean, quite frankly, if everyone who listened just donated $1 a month, I would exceed my fundraising goals super easily. So this doesn't have to be a huge donation or cause any type of distress. But if you find value in this podcast, I it's it's a passion of mine. I want to continue to do it. I think I've heard lots of positive feedback from it. I think it's a great resource and would love to continue to offer it. Anyway, just keep a donation in mind. And uh, if you're interested in any of my presentations or workshops that are coming up, and I deal with issues around mental health, sexuality, faith transitions, please visit my personal page at natashaparker.org. If you're interested in professional services, that's where you can find my practice as well. Okay, so given that, I would like to just say that we are here today to discuss why the certain changes in the temple language may have some mental health implications for the members of the church. And joining us today will be Sarah Hughes Zabawa from Minnesota, Jimmy Bridges from Kansas, and Lisa Butterworth from Idaho. All return guests to the show and all fabulous in their brains and ways that they conceptualize things. I'm super excited to have a really exciting, effective, helpful conversation about this today. So if I could, just in the order I introduced you, so that's Sarah, Jimmy, and then Lisa, if you could just say a few words, letting people know who you are and um, what you're about, that would be great. Thanks, Natasha. Quick correction, I'm in Montana, but it's fair because I've been in Michigan, so it makes sense that I'd also be in Minnesota. What did I say? Oh, I said Minnesota. (laughs) I'm so lame. (laughs) You're so fine. (laughs) So you can find me in Billings, Montana, where I live with my um, family full of young children and a really crazy sheepdog. Um, I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I specialize in trauma as well as specific women's issues. And then I'm also a wellness coach with Symmetry Solutions, so I'm so grateful to be here. I often work with our Mormon clientele, and this topic is definitely one that is near and dear to my clinical heart. Thank you so much. Yeah, go ahead, Jimmy. Um, So I'm Jimmy Bridges. I am a PhD student here at Kansas State University um, here in Manhattan, in Manhattan, Kansas. Um, I'm a, so I'm a clinician um, there at Symmetry Solutions with Natasha I am um, a researcher as well. Um, I study 
uh, queer Mormon populations. My clinical work focuses mainly on couples work and engaging men in the therapy process, but engaging men also in uh, raising their consciousness about gender inequality and gender disparities. Hi, I am Lisa Butterworth. I am also a clinician, um, wellness coach and therapist at Symmetry Solutions. And I am the founder of Feminist Mormon Housewives and I live in Idaho and have teenagers, old teenagers. So get on. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, you are all great. I just love working with all of you. And if any of you have the opportunity to meet any of these fabulous people, please do so because they're just phenomenal. So, all right. So diving into kind of how I want to structure the conversation, I think that a good place to start is to... Um, make sure that people feel like we're being respectful to the temple ceremony. We do not mean to share any information that would be considered sacred or um, kind of in that sense of like privacy that people who go to the Mormon temple and, um, you know, participate in what we call ordinances and ceremonies um, that's considered very sacred work. And part of that means that it's also kind of kept secret in the sense that we don't really talk about those types of many of those things within um, kind of public sphere. So I want to keep um, obviously a, 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 an honoring of that tradition within our faith community. So I'm committed to not sharing anything that we commit in the temple to not share. Um, my understanding as I've looked through a lot of these things is that the things that we'll be talking about, especially the language that will be talked about is not part of the things that we're asked to not share publicly. So I think that we can have a fairly good robust discussion about some of the changes, which are mainly gender uh, changes from what women used to say to now what women are going to be saying now, as well as a few changes for men as well. So those are not things that, in, at least in my opinion, break that, you know, kind of honoring of the tradition of keeping things sacred and secret in that regard. Um, so having said that, I would like to start our conversation talking about what we as a group, as a panel, um, feel comfortable sharing as far as what were some of the previous, what was some of the previous language and why was some of the previous language problematic, especially from a gender perspective and why we maybe think some of those things actually could affect mental health. And when I say mental health, I'm talking about personal identity, talking about gender roles. I'm talking about power dynamics within marital relationships. Um, I think it can affect sexuality, right? So these are all the kinds of categories that why we feel that this is a mental health topic. So I'm just going to kind of put it out there for my panelists to talk about um, maybe Lisa, since you're like um, the founder of Mormon Feminist Housewives, would you want to give us like a, at least the audience, because not everybody who's listening may even understand what we're talking about, kind of a quick overview of what you felt the language was like prior to the changes that we've just seen recently. Yeah. So, um, one of the things that I think um, was most prominent was that at, at, at a point, um, women make some promises um, or are told, I'm trying to remember exactly <laughs> how it goes, I, I probably should have taken some notes, um, that um, we were priestesses unto our husbands and, um, and men were priests unto God. And so that was really a problematic um, framing of things. It, there were definitely um, there were definitely arguments to be made that theologically that sort of made our husbands our God to be worshipped, or that at least minimally that our husbands were a pathway through which we could speak to God or to have a relationship with God. That there wasn't a possibility of having a direct relationship with God. Um, and so obviously that's pretty problematic. Um, and in fact, for many women, that that one moment right there felt like a break in um, a break in their relationship with God. A lot of a lot of women that I have talked to, a lot of women that I know, it was really a defining moment for them. 
um, to hear that their relationship was with their husband while their husband's relationship was with God and, and definitely um, created spiritual crisis for a lot of people. And a lot of people who had not expected or, or been thinking about any issues with that, with the church prior to that. Um, that's the one that stands out most for me um, personally. There's also a lot of women who, um, who had a very difficult time with the veiling. Um, there, there's a veil that women were asked to put over their faces at, at, at a point in the ceremony. And for a lot of women, that really felt like they were being told that they were like separated from um, the process or that there was something shameful about their face or their, you know, that there was something shameful about who they were. And that, that veiling was really traumatic and difficult for a lot of people. And then that veiling was also just difficult for a lot of women based on like, um, like fears of small spaces or not feeling like they could see things <laughs> clearly, right? And not feeling like they had a choice about whether they were going to be covering their faces or not. Um, and, and that was sort of a matter of, for some women, a matter of even like consent. Like they didn't know that they were gonna be asked to veil their faces. They weren't emotionally or prepared for that. And the price of not doing it was often quite high. Um, there were, I think there were ch some changes made in the marriage ceremony mm -hmm. and, and I'm forgetting exactly what they were. Do, do you guys remember exactly what they were? Well, so some of the language that I think that you're talking about just from your first point is that the, the language was hearken. You're to hearken to your husband as your husband hearkens to God, right? So the idea that if the man is hearkening to God, then he must be doing things correctly. And then the woman hearkens to the husband and then everybody is okay. Right. And, and I want to point out too, that um, temple worship isn't typically done until adulthood and throughout all of our, you know, primary education and young men's and young women's education and adolescence, we're not, we're taught something very different. We're taught much more about having a personal relationship with God, being able to pray directly to God, um, you know, personal revelation, personal agency, right? All these Mormon principles. So I think to your point, Lisa, a lot of women are kind of shocked by that temple language that now it feels more like the relationship is shifting to, you know, a secondary relationship with Heavenly Father. Um, and then the marriage, um, what I've heard, because I haven't actually been myself, is that the marriage ceremony now before used to say something about uh, the men would say something along the lines of I receive you, I receive you. And women would say the language of I give myself to you. And this is um, slated in polygamy culture and tradition from our forefathers, where, you know, if you give yourself, you kind of do that once, but you can receive you know, lots of people. So I believe now the, um, the language has been receive for both. Both people are using the term receive. Uh, at the same time, this is one of the things that we'll talk about maybe a little bit later, some of that uh, polygamy language hasn't necessarily changed. So we'll, we'll talk about that kind of in our, in our current critiques, maybe of, of what of the changes. Jimmy or Sarah, would you add anything to what's been said so far? Yes, Natasha, what you just said about the language of hearken, I think from a mental health perspective for individuals, words matter. And so what we've seen in, um, what I have seen in my clinical setting, particularly within couples, and I'd love Jimmy's perspective of this as he works predominantly with couples, is the narrative in the temple where there's a hearkening, right? Where a woman is hearkening to her husband as her husband hearkens unto God. There's an immediate set um, power differential. Now, did every does every couple influenced by that language? No, but some couples that I worked with were absolutely were. And that narrative was abused in forms of controlling, in forms of emotional and spiritual abuse and manipulation. And once again, when a narrative, something that's 
is considered incredibly holy um, or the words of God is justified in creating a power differential in a marriage, it can be incredibly hurtful to both partners, right? Because they were not stepping in equally into ownership of the relationship and who is empowered in their own decision making. And so when a hierarchy is presented, that can be incredibly devastating when abused and it has been thank you jimmy some of your thoughts about the prior language and effects it might have had yeah um my thoughts go right to just how in a way and it's similar to what you had just been um referring to sarah that i mean i'm i'm one to believe that our our faith traditions and the fundamental ways we construct um, our doctrine do have a trickle-down effect into the home, into the individual. And so when I think about um, the language of hearken to your husbands as your husbands hearken to the Lord, I think in this situation, the previous situation before prior uh, pre-change, men are having this divinely sanctioned endorsement of um, gender inequality, a gender disparity within the relationship. And I think that really does matter. I think it's, it, it might be, it might be, some might be skeptical of if that really does change how someone sees themselves, how, how a man sees their role in a family. Um, but I, I would say, I mean, if we just like analyze society and gender inequality within society, that's, I mean, we, we can't, we can't uh, believe that how we feel and how we see ourselves in the temple is divorced from how society constructs how we see ourselves. And so because those are connected, I really do think that the, the, pri the previous language and some of the language in the family proclamation does this too, um, it, it does, it divinely sanctions traditional roles that, um, marginalize women and, and elevate men. So first of all, I want to just say to anybody who's listening, we're, we're more than happy to take comments and questions. Um, if you can do that through the Mormon mental health Facebook page, because that's the only page I'll be monitoring for comments. Um, so please feel free to do that. Um, so going back to what all of you have said, then why would this why would we as mental health professionals be concerned about gender disparity as part of a, why would we call that a mental health issue? Because power differentials impact mental health, right? So what I have seen with my clients is where there's been huge power differentials or narratives from the temple utilized in spiritual manipulation or abuse within a marriage that impacts depression, that impacts suicidal ideation, it impacts anxiety. So much of what we've seen, I think, as clinicians with individuals who've had ne negative experiences due to temple narratives is because it creates a cognitive dissonance, right? What I know to be true about myself versus what I'm told to be true about myself. I think for many women, the temple caused sincere anxiety or depression or cognitive dissonance, meaning some real cognitive distress as they weighed through what was told to them about their divine nature versus what they knew for themselves and the wrestle in between. So when it's showing up in our in our clients, in our offices, Natasha, where what's happening in the temple is impacting emotional wellness individually, as well as, like Jimmy said, within the family, it matters. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Anybody else have thoughts about this? I mean, I think it's like, it's one of those things that seems so obvious to me that it's almost hard for me to articulate <laughs> just because <laughs> I see it so often. Um but I think it, um, I mean, I go, reflecting back what Jimmy said, I see it reflected in a lot of the, the pain that happens when couples come in in relationship. And often the husbands are as distressed as the wives when they realize that there were um, behaviors that they enacted in the power differential that they weren't even aware that they were doing, the ways in which they, um, the ways in which they were sort of 
abusing their power and yet weren't even really aware of that abuse of power because it was part of the narrative that they were handed when they got married or they went to, they went to the temple and often that's that that pain and that um, distress in the marriage really started in the temple and and it wasn't necessarily what either of the the woman or the man were anticipating would happen. And then those um, those those difficulties, even even if a couple manages to unpack all of the ways that they sort of enacted these in, this inequality of power and and are able to discuss it, which that's a big ask right there. Just being able to just being able to unpack. Okay, well here are the ways that I the the man. Um, took advantage of or didn't even see that I was using this power differential. Um, that's, that's a really heavy thing to ask. And then even if they can unpack that, the wounds that I see within relationships continue on for years. Um, and often, and often there's something of a taboo of even discussing or talking about especially in a mixed faith marriage, there's some taboo or there's some difficulty of even discussing the ways in which these power differentials were enacted in, in really harmful ways. Are, are any of us able to give specific examples? You know, sometimes I think as therapists and clinicians, we get caught up in the abstract, you know, like the abstract um, presentation of a problem what how would this actually show up in people's lives what are some examples that you can think of either from people you know in your own words or stakes or family or or cl clients who've come in with certain types of presentations as far as how this shows up um i'm gonna speak from um i guess just clinically when i'm with couples um it's been mentioned before how oblivious some men are to the level of pain that they're, if we're talking about heterosexual couples, um, the level of pain that their wives are experiencing. And um, this is both frustrating and uh, completely predictable. One, it's frustrating because, I mean, if I'm thinking about my position as a man and um, thinking about, I, I see, um, my wife's in pain, she's depressed or anxious. And I, I, I haven't necessarily typically been coached or, or primed into know what to do with that. And there's this strange, I think, um, setup that, that the, the LDS narrative of what a man's supposed to be um, contributes to this problem. Um, men, and at least this is how I felt, we have the privilege and status of the decision-making power in the church organization and within families kind of encouraged to preside, um, encouraged to, to lead. Um, but at the same time, that's, that's countered by how, um, a lot of women feel for carrying the emotional burdens of the family. And it's an interesting kind of paradox because on the one hand, um, men have all this power. And on the other hand, um, when it comes to relational well-being and, and who carries most of the emotional burdens, men kind of check out. And I think, um, I, I mean, I try to get men in, in therapy and couples therapy to both to do two things, own up to that, but also recognize that they're the perpetrators and victims. So they're perpetrators in that they, they're causing harm that they really are, have been, they're not trained to see, but also they're victims because they're getting fed these narratives that they're not supposed to be that sensitive. They're not supposed to be that in tune to the relationship. Um, this goes into uh, some of the, a lot of the work, a lot of the theory and research that's been done on what we call hegemonic masculinity, which is basically the ideal way of being a man in a society. And in a, in a really, in a real tangible, concrete way, religious communities and the, um, the LDS community contributes to what that means. So in society at large, we have um, 
uh, typical ideal behaviors like competition, aggression, independence, constant pursuit of sex, constant sex readiness. These are kind of like ideal um, ways of being man, and they're typically counterproductive to relational well-being. You add on religious con uh, communities' con contributions to those ideals, and you get um, a compounded view of you know, this man's supposed to lead, he's supposed to take charge, he's supposed to be held responsible for all the decision-making that goes on in the family. Um, he's supposed to provide. He's supposed to provide, right, preside and protect. And it's, this is what's difficult. It's, it, this is, I'm not going to say sneaky. I, as a clinician, I have to, I have to be, I have to find the connection, and typically it, it's not very hard to do, that from aggression, independence, competition, the line from that to preside, provide, and protect is not as um, distant and spread as, as we might think. Because when we think about Mormon men, we think about someone who's kind and compassionate and respectful and a family man. And to um, and the more you start to unpack really what that looks like when compared to societal's view of what it means to be a man, the lines start to blur. You start to really realize, oh, it's the same influence. It's the same system of patriarchy. It's the same system of toxic masculinity that's preventing men from tuning in to the issues of their relationship. Um, so it's uh it's subtle and and um michelle who michelle busk who's been on the uh, podcast before has d uh, looked into the construct of benevolent sexism and um hammond is his last name the researcher who uh looked into that construct and really what that's trying to get at is this very subtle form of harm that's perpetuated within relationships uh that's fed by toxic masculinity that's fed by patriarchal structures i think that's yeah yeah and the apa add. just came out with a position on toxic masculinity i encourage everybody to look at that link which i shared on my facebook page at least so that's really interesting how we're raising our boys right is mm -hmm. is a big part of this um coming at it from a relational lens you know i'm a marriage and family therapist we do know that some of the markers for the healthier types of long-term relationships and they tend to be very egalitarian in nature and patriarchy just doesn't set up either women or men to know how to have successful egalitarian relationships so um i think this is really unfortunate um and and you know being a sex therapist too i see this trickle into people's sexual lives where a lot of times women are coming at their sexuality from a duty or gatekeeping perspective instead of really owning and having um, that be more of an authentic experience that they're able to explore and bring to the table. And so, uh, so they may be performing sexually, but not in ways that are always the most helpful for either themselves or the relationship. Um, whereas men are kind of in, implicitly given that permission to be sexual beings, you know, through the patriarchal lens for sure. And, and in fact, those messages can be very harming too, especially um, when it's an expectation, you know, instead of um, something that happens authentically within a man as well. And I think um, when we look at um, identity, whenever you have, um, in a way, I, sometimes I call the construct we have in Mormonism is kind of perpetual adolescence, because there's always like this other authority that we have to answer to, you know, whether it's God, or whether it's a state president, or whether it's a bishop or whether it's our husband, um, there's always somebody that we can be in trouble with in a way. And therefore that kind of interferes with adult development. And I think both men and women struggle with that in Mormon culture, but I think women even at a whole nother level because now there's more authority that's placed above them. And that in can include um, the person that they're supposed to be an actual partner with. I, I think the cognitive dissonance in the family proclamation is, tr is really very difficult when you have this idea of, well, you let the man preside, but I'm going to be an equal with you. Like, how does that even work? That those things are not um, concepts that can coexist in a way. And so these issues show up 
by either oftentimes I see a, a man uh, taking on that kind of patriarchal role and being kind of a leader, or he kind of steps aside and almost gives the woman artificial leadership, which still isn't completely on her own accord. And so it's like, we just don't do egalitarian relationships very well in Mormonism, and we haven't been taught how to, and in fact, the scripts go against egalitarianism. So it's it's really um, does affect people's self-esteem, affects people's identity affects um, how they feel maybe constructed or, or limited in their gender roles. Like this is how I'm supposed to act. So if I want to act a different way, I can't. Uh, it takes away personal authority. Um, it kind of stunts us in a lot of ways that are very tied to our mental health. I like that Jimmy talked about how subtle some of these things are, because I feel like it's it's really easy to point out where things can go wrong badly, right? Like it's really easy to point out because I, and I definitely have clients where this is the case where like worst case scenario happens, husband is like, you need to hearken unto me. You vowed, like you said, and that happens, right? Worst case scenario. But most of the time, the harm I see isn't the worst case scenario harm. And I think this is where some people can get confused because they're like, oh, well, sure. Maybe we say these things in the temple, but we don't really mean them and you don't actually see them playing out in those obvious abusive ways usually. And I think that's true. You don't usually see them playing out. It does. It does play out in abusive ways and that's real. But most of the time, I think the harm is more subtle. It's more like, I, I mean, a really common one that I think af that affects relationships again is that you know, let's say that you have a couple where the husband isn't providing in that way that there's a lot of pressure to, you know, like be the sole provider, which in some ways isn't terribly realistic in this modern economy. And if he cannot do that, then there's, there's a sense that he's a failure or there's some contempt towards him. And that can set up in the personal relationship, you know, like this expectation of you should be this rather than being able to accept, no, this is who you are and I can love you exactly as you are. Or, and it can go the other way towards the woman as well. Like, you know, women who struggle with infertility, <laughs> women who struggle with, um, you know, whatever the role is that she, that her husband is, that she's supposed to be hearkening to him about what her role is. If she doesn't, if she doesn't thrive in that, then, or even if she does sometimes, then there is this sort of like, well, you should be better at this. You should be, and rather than being able to arrive with who we actually are, there, the, you know, like this language sets us up in these expectations. And then we have a really hard time accepting the person we're married to instead of um, wishing or hoping or shooting that they should be something else. I'd really like to contribute to that, Lisa, because it, it, it can be so subtle. So much of what I see, Natasha, is the fact that shame can breed in secrecy. And there's this double-edged sword regarding the temple. It's considered um, one of the highest spiritual experiences Mormons can have, right? There's a huge push and draw to get families, individuals, and couples to the temple. Um, and it's, it's regarded with a lot of love and affection, right? And yet some of that subtle, that subtle um, mental health challenges is someone has worked their whole life or has gone through some real big hurdles to meet the worthiness challenges to enter the temple. And their first temple experience isn't something that felt safe or something that they were emotionally prepared for. Or like Lisa said, didn't even know consensually what they would be promising to do. There's really no space with in the culture, the mainstream culture, to have the conversation to say, what just happened, right? So individuals having real emotional responses to the temple that goes against the narrative of beauty and love and a place of peace creates some real cognitive distortions, right? Like what's wrong with me that I that the temple isn't emotionally safe or what's wrong with me that when I hear this narrative and feel less than as a woman that bothers me. And then when people go to their ecclesiastical leaders to have these heartfelt conversations because they can't have them safely in the main, like in relief society or with their visiting teachers, 
there's that power differential and they're also often diminished in what they're tr truly feeling, right? So there's also going to be cognitive distortions in individuals who really struggled with the temple narrative were told to, that that's the way God intended it and then change ha changes happen, which I think will lead into a different conversation of where's the accountability for where harm has been done regarding narratives, but it's subtle, right? Like the inability to say, I have some complicated feelings about the temple and in safety without feeling like there's something wrong with you um, is a lot of some of that subtle distress that I have seen with clients, just not having the relationship with the temple that they thought they should, right? Yeah. Or having the emotional response to the temple that they thought they should, um, or being scared of that, being scared of the experience of the temple. Where is the narrative that people can say, they were scared, right? There's no safe space to even have that conversation. And that can definitely impact anxiety. That can impact depression because people aren't feeling safe enough to have conversation with their loved ones about their temple experience because there's a narrative that it's supposed to be beautiful mm -hmm. and wonderful and the pivotal moment of their spiritual progression within Mormonism. And when that's not met up, that's usually internalized as a deficit in character. Thank you. Jimmy had a last thought there. Yeah, just that I, Sarah, I think you're like hitting it right on the head with secrecy, the effects of that secrecy. I, I also wondered if there's post changes, a double layer of secrecy um, by discouraging the discussion of the changes. In a way, we're forcing men's eyes shut to the reality that women who were deemed struggling in their faith actually had a voice which influenced temple rituals, changes that most Mormons would consider doctrine. Um, I, I, I believe that this does impact, um, impact the family, the relationship as well. I mean, if you think about how it's impacting men or treating men's sense of self with fragility by withholding information or men missing out on opportunities to see women um, and if they're heterosexual, if they're future partners and as individuals with influence, equal capacity for leadership and making change. But we kind of like cut all that out if we say, don't talk about it. Don't talk about the change or where it really came from and all the focus groups and all the women. And, and what we know is shame breeds in secrecy, Yeah. right? So there's been right. cultures of shame for very normal responses. Um, and I agree with you, Jimmy. I think the not talking about it is increasing shame and also silencing where there could be some real substantial healing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you. So um, first of all, Leslie Ann Butterfield says, yay, Jimmy Bridges. So there you go. You got a fan, Jimmy. And then uh, Gary Fredrickson says, yes, even the phrase, I am a child of God, when we repeat it, sets us up as infants. So that's, I guess, um, a response to my comment of perpetual adolescence. Um, so moving on, I think, you know, and let's let's address this big change. I mean, this is a big change. Um, I definitely want to give credit to the church for listening, I think, over the years to, like you're saying, focus groups, women. Um, this has been an area of discussion for as long as I can remember. Um, and so there have been some significant changes in the temple language, which we don't see a lot of time. I mean, the last time that happened was probably, I think, in the 80s. Um, and so it, it does at least um, speak to the idea that change is possible, you know, that, um, that the leadership can be somewhat attuned to the needs of its members, that members' voices do matter. And so I'd like to talk a little bit now about what do we think is good about the changes? What, what are we excited about? What do we see as positive steps in the right direction? You know, on a kind of personal level, one of my best friend's daughters is getting married in a couple weeks in the temple. <laughs> and I am super happy that when she goes to the temple next week, that she isn't going to have that painful, you know, like not every woman does, did have an incredibly painful experience, but I, I'm just super happy that that isn't going to be for her part of the weight that she has to take in. I know that that for me, it, you know, like I got endowed the day before my wedding and um, 
it was supposed to be the best thing in the world. And I, I was struggling and I wasn't supposed to be struggling. And it really changed the tone of that whole experience for me. Like my, my wedding in and of itself wasn't, I don't see it as like the joyful, hopeful moment that I was really wanting because I have all these memories, you know, attached to it um, that I wasn't really expecting. And, um, and I'm, and I couldn't be happier. <laughs> I could not be happier that, that this dear daughter of my friend who, you know, like, I feel like is almost my own daughter, that she isn't going to have to carry that. Um, and I, and I know that, that, that is, that there's a mixed feeling there as well in that just, even though I'm so happy that she don't, doesn't have to carry that, it still feels like there's going to be, um, there's going to be an inability, a lack of freedom to talk about the change in that, you know, she's never going to understand <laughs> the pain I did experience. You know, like, I, I don't know that we'll ever, I, maybe at some point she might ask or be curious, but there's something that's lost when the next generation goes in and has this great, wonderful experience. And you're like, oh, it was super painful for me, but you can't say that. And they don't know that. And, you know, it, it, it creates this distance and this sort of break in the generation of like, I can't, I can't, I can't within the rules that are sort of set up in our culture of sort of secrecy or silence around this, I can't have a real discussion with her about how different her experience is going to be from mine. And even though I'm super happy, it's going to be different. There's something that feels really painful about that. Thank you. Here. Anybody else want to talk about positives? Well, going back, Natasha, to words matter, I'm really happy to see that there is a narrative of greater equality, right? And that this is more of a partnering relationship and that we're stepping into the modern era where I would hope any institution, though we, Jimmy's pointed out it's not that easy, any institution re realizes the equality of women. And so so grateful that future generations will not have sexist narratives in their spiritual moments, but also honoring what Lisa said, that for decades there have been sexist narratives and how that has influenced women and men in their spiritual understanding of themselves and spiritual understanding of others. Thank you. Any thoughts, Jimmy, from you as far as positive changes? Yeah, I, I wanted to go back to what you had said about um, some of the research on egalitarian relationships. I think in a very real way, it's going back to what you, um, Sarah, your comments too, that this is um, relationships, men and women, mostly men. Uh, my hope is that if actual reflection ends up happening, men see this as a divinely sanctioned reminder of egalitarian, egalitarian relationships. And some of the research you had mentioned that egalitarian relationships are better off um, for both partners, both in heterosexual couples, men and women fare better when men um, engage more in household tasks and childcare and um, both men and women fare better when that stuff's happening physically and mentally. There's some really strong associations with that and then and they have more sex surprise surprise um whoop, whoop. yeah and and the other way around too where women are taking on more of a career identity or professional right. identity or you know contributing to the finances of the home or feeling empowered in some of those ways that that also has borne out in the research yeah and and men who who experience the temple before and after like pre-change post-change have a this is my hope. I, it's, I'm, I'm being idealistic right now. It's really hard because I'm typically skeptical. <laughs> um, men hopefully have a unique opportunity to reflect on why. Why did this change happen? Hopefully it becomes a feminist awakening for men. Um, because like when you think about it, um, this is what I kind of been reflecting on. When I first learned that women placed hands on other women in initiatories. When I first learned that, you could say that that was a, a budding beginning of my feminist awakening. Mm -hmm. Most of us, um, 
will not know that it, unless we have a close, a close female friend or a sister or someone who's going to be that open. Um, uh, typically, boys are not learning that until temple becomes a normal part of their life. Mm -hmm. um, and that's in young adulthood. And so they get this like idea that they're the only ones with this huge power. So I use that as an example because um, this is one another unique time in our history where men have the potential to have to if they connect this with gender because it is gender. We're talking about gender. We're talking about gender inequality, patriarchy. We're talking about um, disparities here. If men think about that and connect this change to that. I, I, I think that's a great step. Um, Michael Kimmel, who, who's done a lot, a ton of research on men and masculinities. Um, I just read a quote from him. He said, making gender visible to men is the first step to engaging men to support gender equality. Mm -hmm. So if this is just a revelation that is just for the church, because we had a revelation, I don't think this, this connection is going to happen. I think if men true, like really independently really think about this and reflect on, oh, this is a gender thing, I think it starts, I think it awakens them up to the fact that, oh, I'm a man, I'm not just a person. Um, and, I'm, and this is different for women and men in the temple, um, or it has been different. Yeah, and I would add to that, that I think, I hope it's a feminist awakening for women as well. You know, oftentimes there's a certain segment of women or a minority group who are affected, kind of like Lisa had said earlier, you know, some women go to the temple and have kind of this very uncomfortable um, experience. Other women go and have a very different experience. I quite frankly probably wouldn't have picked out all of the gender issues when I first went to the temple. I don't think that I was aware of gender issues in the same way that I am now. Um, and oftentimes the oppressed group is the last one to in a majority be upset about their oppression. Right. So that's pointed out in social science as well. So I, I would hope that women can really, because we have to be invested in our own oppression. <laughs> so there's reasons why that's the case. It's not because we're stupid. It's because we are having to live within the oppression and, and we learn, we are taught by the system how to be invested in that oppression. And so I think that it can be very helpful for women as well to take that same invitation that you just gave to men, Jimmy, which is, what is this about? Why would the church move? And what we're all saying is a very healthy, progressive way towards gender equality um, and how how do those messages really apply to my life and to my power dynamics within my current relationships? How does that message apply to my sense of self as a female, as a woman? Um, how do I um, co construct myself as a woman in the world around me and, and place myself in all of these different dynamics, whether it's at the ward level, my family level, community level, you know? So I think that's a wonderful thing. And I just... <clears throat> want to second a lot of what you said that I'm in love with the language. I think the language is beautiful. I, I love, um, you know, in, in most religious practices and not just in Mormonism, being able to have a direct relationship with God is something that I think people find very um, profound and sacred and beautiful. And um, I, I think to have women have that same language as men is, is just something that's phenomenal. And I'm so, so very, thankful to the leaders who, um, you know, all played a role in, in making this happen the way they did. Well, in one of the ways they did. All right. So I think what we want to finish out the um, podcast with then is, well, are we done? Is this, is this a done deal? Are we, is the problem solved? <laughs> and so what, what is still lacking? Why do we think things are lacking? And, and maybe one of the things I want to start with, which actually most of you already somewhat mentioned is that it's interesting to me that one of the dynamics in church changes, and I've seen this over the many decades when there have been church changes is that the church isn't super great at following its own um, prescribed um, equation for repentance. So when we're all taught repentance from a very early age, you know, one of the main things um, is self-awareness, right? So the first thing is like, I've got to know that I did something wrong or that something was awry. And then the second part is the taking responsibility piece, right? So we have to take responsibility. 
we have to go and directly address the party that has been injured and say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And then you can do your own self-work, you know, kind of the other steps of repentance is, you know, how do I make sure I don't do that again? How do I make sure that I, you know, develop as a person so that I'm not in the space that I was in before. So the church, unfortunately, sucks at apologies. And in fact, they kind of have come out, um, well, at least Elder Oaks, you know, and speaking on behalf of the church as one of its apostles, has directly said that they do not offer apologies. So that's very strange and weird to me. And I think it speaks to especially what Lisa was talking about, the invalidation of all of us who have lived through this kind of harmful process where we did feel harm, where we did feel confusion, where many times we were ostracized in our own ward communities or ostracized in our families if we brought these types of issues up, seen as less faithful, seen as less valiant, seen as less committed to the religion because we have these complaints. And, and in fact, um, Elder Boyd K. Packer, you know, not that long ago called feminists an actual enemy to the church, which many of us, um, you know, identify as Mormon feminist women and men. So why don't we talk a little bit about, you know, just that concept of why are apologies, again, from a mental health perspective, so important to the healing and the well-being of the community at large? I'd like to begin with the crazy making of not being justified in your um, disillusionment or you're in your distress. I can't tell you how many clients that I've worked with who've gone to leaders to discuss in since with real sincerity the distress they experience in the temple, both as a man or as a woman. Um, and to have that either be belittled or to not have any real substance in which to understand or help that individual move through their emotional response to narratives or experiences in the temple not creating and then all of a sudden they're changed right so that there's no space for really say like mourning with those that mourn and Natasha you're right I don't think from an institutional perspective we're going to see that apology but where there's an invitation is at the ground level where within our own lives our clients lives our clients families and ecclesiastical leadership can there be apologies made can keep can, can that repentance be really adopted in ourselves and in the community so people are validated you know that might be a simple conversation between a father and a daughter that is you know what when you came to me and you really talked to me about the temple and I downgraded that experience for you I'm sorry right like where is there space for mourning with those who have mourned and those who have been harmed by previous narratives while celebrating change and I that's where apology is so beneficial because it honors the wounding it honors the pain and it gives a space for individuals to reconnect and to rebuild trust and pain that is validated doesn't stick around as long we it just, doesn't. that's just, yeah, it's just a reality. Lisa, Jimmy? Well, as long as we're looking at the positives, I, um, I, I have heard some people who have had positive experiences going in and talking to their bishops and stake presidents about these changes. And I, I've specifically had some, some people have stake presidents and bishops apologize to them. And, and, and I think that that's really powerful. I mean, it is, again, not going to be consistent. There are going to still be bishops and stake presidents who refuse to talk about it or refuse to admit. And, and I think that that's a positive thing. I think it's a positive thing that I can see very specific with very specific people that they go in and they say, look at this change. What do you think? And, 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 and to receive acknowledgement and apology from people who in that power differential have that power. Um, and, and so that's a real change that is happening and has happened in some people's lives. Um, doesn't change the fact that for many other people that, that won't happen. <laughs> and it's certainly unlikely to happen in any official capacity from, from you know, like the, the church itself. But, but that's a positive thing for individuals in their spiritual journeys to have, to have some sort of um, some sort of acknowledgement from the power structure that their pain was rooted in something real. Absolutely. Love that. 
Any other thoughts about, it doesn't have to be about the apology aspect of things, but what's, what's either hasn't been addressed, what's still possibly problematic about the temple ceremony in regards to gender inequality? What would, what, you know, if we had a magic wand, what would look different even from what's happened today? I think the uh, most obvious thing, oh, sorry. Nope, go for it. I think the most obvious thing is, you know, like all of the people who still don't fit into yep. the narrative of men and women, um, intersex people who maybe mm -hmm. don't identify as male or female and don't have clear and don't have a clear gender. I mean, like that one's really obvious and really understandable, even if you don't, even if you do not believe um, in the equality of our transgender brothers or sisters or our gay and lesbian brothers and sisters, like intersex people are just born <laughs> you know like and there's no space there and and then once you open up the subject of our you know like our trans brothers and sisters our gay and lesbian brothers and sisters like there's really no space for their experience in the temple and and that is that is you know like an institutional tragedy and it's um and and, and it's not just that, it's also just single people. <laughs> you know, like there's really not a lot of space to be a single unmarried person within the structure of the temple. You know, like it's all predicated on this idea that, you know, like either we'll have a husband and a wife or a husband and a bunch of wives. <laughs> but, you know, like what if you're, yeah, the, the, the temple isn't really set up. It's set up for these pairs that are male with and female it's yeah obviously that's a big that's the biggest one that seems to me to be jimmy want to add to that because that seemed to be what you were going that's after as well mm -hmm. yeah i just love blair's uh blair ostler's comment um she gave shortly after the changes of the dual nature of this that this is great you know great change and that at the same time there's just so many still who are being marginalized and continue pushed further to the fringes um even in the change so this is what's um this is what's like difficult to sit with as someone as all of us who all we are all for um providing resources for the marginalized um and this is the difficult part one step forward for one group um sometimes acts to silence the struggles of another group um so uh queer mormon um folks um are you know blair i think is reminding us that hey we're still here this is still an issue this is still a massive massive issue there's still the mental health uh struggles for those who are who identify as queer and who are raised in LDS settings, it's just massive, massive hurt and harm that occurs, not to say nothing of the temple. Um, the temple adds this really like almost irrelevant matter to it because like Lisa, you had mentioned too that, and Sarah, that the structural issues are just there regardless if someone goes to the temple or not um, for queer uh, Mormons and Temple isn't even a possibility for yeah. most queer. Yeah, members. which is yeah, which is so devastating because if you think about holy places of worship, um, just from a world religions perspective, holy places of worship are where you you rejuvenate yourself, where you find the, the meaningful meditation, where you find that you connect more fully. There's something about going to a physical place, and when that place is sanctioned by your group your tribe um as one of the most holy places on earth um you know and there's these invitations left and right come to the temple come to the temple come sit at our table but you have to be straight and heterosexual and cisgender and um you know you have to fit this uh, but please work through your issues and come it's just like uh mind-boggling that that the invitation is made still yeah thank you Sarah, yes any thoughts because when i was even posing the question you were like 
no, we're not done. <laughs> we're not done. I'm so glad that Lisa and Jimmy talked about our LGBTQIA plus brothers and sisters who still may or may not feel included in moving forward in their temple worship if they desire to. And that is something we are at a loss unless all of them are at our table. And so I want to vocalize that. Um, Natasha, you mentioned this, but polygamy within the temple narrative and temple structure has not been eliminated. That's Meaning right. Meaning men can still be sealed to multiple women. And I can't tell you how many clients I have seen injured by the eternal ghost of polygamy, you know, as our Carolyn Pearson would talk about. So polygamy in its, in its historic form, um, as well as its in modern interpretation, still is harming families. I totally agree with that. And I want to get a little bit more specific about that. Um, so in other words, the, the covenant making now that the promise that is being made is directly related to the um, covenant of eternal marriage. And you don't have to know very much about Mormonism to understand. And it's right there, actually, in our current scripture, that the covenant of eternal marriage does include polygamy. And that, so right off the bat, and this is one of the kind of personal reasons why I began to have such a difficult time at the temples that I felt like I had non-consensually agreed to uh, before my understanding of all the language that I had been kind of, um, you know, kind of bamboozled into a polygamous kind of ceremony that I didn't even realize was polygamous to begin with. And that comes, you know, a lot of Mormons will say, well, that's ridiculous. We're not polygamous. We don't believe in polygamy. But the reality is that um, in the eternities, polygamy is still very much a doctrinal um, aspect of Mormonism. We do, like um, one of you said, allow men to be sealed to more than one wife, which means have a relationship with more than one wife. Um, women are not allowed that. And that's to, to second what Sarah has said. I've had people and just in horrific situations, you know, like where they've maybe been married once, um, a spouse has died, you know, the, the female's uh, husband has died, uh, she's still, you know, early 30s, is wanting to marry her second husband, who she plans to also have children with, you know, may have one or two child with this initial husband, and now her choices are completely different than a male in that situation, right? So she has to either... Um, do away with the initial sealing, which means now her new husband will become the adoptive father of the of this past man's um, children, or she can get married for time and all you know for time only with this new husband, and any children that they have will be kind of like sealed to the initial husband. So it's like a complete horrific dilemma that we put women in. Whereas men, you know, if, if a wife dies, um, my husband could go get married tomorrow to somebody in the, if in the temple and, you know, everybody would be kind of sealed to him, all, all of his wives and all of the children. And, you know, that's um, a little bit more, I guess, I mean, maybe he'd feel weird about that, but at least they'd all be still relationally attached to him. And this is the type of dilemma, eternal dilemma that we're trying to pretend that we know enough about heaven, where we um, set people up for these scenarios, which if you can imagine a couple in that situation, what that would do to their egalitarianism that we think about when you've got this kind of third person that's kind of ghostly in the way, <laughs> where you have um, relationships with children, relationships in your sexuality. I mean, we have not dealt with the completely um, horrific and painful and tragic aspect of our history, which is the polygamy doctrine. And it very much, very much, I mean, it wounds everybody, but it wounds women to a whole nother level than it wounds men. And, um, and that has not been addressed. And in fact, I think even has been made more prominent by making the covenant language towards this idea that we covenant towards this particular principle of eternal marriage as Mormonism understands it, which is polygamy. Mm -hmm. I'd like to add that children are dramatically, I have watched children be dramatically impacted by plural ceilings that are continuing in our modern era. Yeah. And it's, and it's unnecessary because, you know, in the dead world, <laughs> we, um, you know, if, if people, if we're doing temple work for the dead, we seal everybody and everybody, you know, and I think a lot of the, uh, if we wanted to, I think, move in a healthier direction towards this, 
uh, the initial, or at least some of the initial ideas or through some lenses, the initial ideas is that the ceiling is of the human family, right? And so then it doesn't matter. You just seal everybody to everybody. We're all, whoever wants to be together, wants to be together. And it doesn't even need to be a marital, you know, like sexual type of ceiling. It's more like a family, like relational ceiling. So there's really, I think, um, some um, unfortunate um, tragedies why we have not been able to address this particular issue that causes profound pain for people in a myriad of, of positions that are, are, are having to face these issues of, of multiple ceilings. So something I would like to bring up as far as things that still we still need to happen about the temple moving forward, and this is a huge mental mental health issue, in fact, it's part of our ethics within the mental health field is issues of consent. Like there are so many issues of consent and, and informed consent that are not, that are not even really a huge part of the discussion about the temple, you know, like, and that I think is something that really needs to be brought more broadly into the conversation that like temple prep classes, you really don't know what's going to happen. I, I don't feel like my temple class, my temple prep class prepared me for anything that happened in the temple. Not a single thing. <laughs> I was yeah. so unprepared. And a friend of mine who recently went through a temple prep class, having more knowledge, she's like, this is nothing. This doesn't even apply. So it's the same now as it was 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. There is not a process of informed consent. And you know, the way that this applies to me very specifically is that I was sort of going through a faith crisis in the midst of wanting to get married. And I was very open with my bishop about that. And, and I was trying to be the good Mormon girl and trust that because he said I was worthy to go to the temple in the midst of my faith crisis, that maybe that was because he had this stewardship you know, which we, which here we've talked about it as a power differential, but in Mormonism, mm -hmm. we might call it, he had stewardship over this decision because I felt like I was honest. I told him that I had these doubts and these fears and these worries. I went into the temple with this hope that the temple would be a really healing place where I would have this amazing experience that I would, you know, like we've talked about that too. And um, there's a point in the temple where you're basically told, if you can't promise all of these things, you need to leave right now. And as I'm sitting there, I felt like I was really, really honest with my bishop about where I was and that he told me this is where I was supposed to be. And yet if I were to stand up right then and walk out, my marriage wouldn't happen the next day. <laughs> like my wedding wouldn't have happened the next day. All of the all of the friends and family and then there would be so much shame and everybody would think that there was something wrong with me, that I'd done something wrong. You know, like there would be blame and shame and 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 that was an issue that lacked so many levels of informed consent that I just don't even know where to start with that um, I was really trapped into agreeing to something that I wasn't really prepared or had any foreknowledge and that of agreeing with and the cost of not agreeing was so high that I had to make a promise that I wasn't ready to make and that I wasn't sure that I should make like I hadn't talked to God about that first <laughs> you know I, and I, had I yeah right then. Mm -hmm. I I so I'm so glad you brought that up I I think there's so you know we don't know what we're going to promise we don't know even though there's that moment where you know you're told if you want to leave you can first of all what a social faux pas that is nobody that I've ever seen ever does that that's just like branding yourself with a scarlet letter a on your forehead and secondly um i i think going back to the gender inequality thing most men in our church go through the temple in preparation for their missions we do have a lot more women in the church who are going on missions these days but many many women especially in our generation go through the temple just a day or so before their wedding and to have those two things aligned, I think is, is a gender issue because like you're saying, that's a spiritual matter. You may or may not have a, a positive experience with that. And to have that tied to one of the most romantic, hopefully, you know, fun and family oriented events in your life should not be paired. And that's an unfair, I think, um, thing that has happened for women in our church as well. So thank you, Jimmy, you were gonna say something before Lisa started what did no okay Sarah I think that, and what Lisa 
what speaking to what Lisa just said, um, I remember when I went through my own endowment and the in retrospect, the the young woman in front of me who was also getting married very shortly after sobbed dry, like sobbed the entire experience. And there in retrospect, there was no space to look at her and honor that she was terrified. You know, instead, that was justified by her mother as she's just really tired. She's just really overwhelmed, right? That there's where people have big responses to doing things that they're not ready for or that there's not consent in which they're moving forward. And one of the, pro I think the positive things in the changes, like Lisa said, regarding consent is veiling the face. No one should ever have to feel like they have to cover a part of their body that that's spe specifically regarding a face without consent. Yeah. And so I think that needs to be a really positive um, step forward in the changes regarding owning what is or is not comfortable with our bodies. Because I remember there was, I didn't know that I had the permission not to. And I don't think anyone in a spiritual setting should have to feel like they're not able to do things that they are not comfortable with. And so where there's future growth, it's culturally, where are we giving permission for a variety of experiences within the temple that there's outs? or that there's permissions not to participate in things that someone is fundamentally uncomfortable with. But once again, there's not, there's so much sacredness and so much narrative that this is supposed to be X, Y, and Z that we're failing our members in meeting them where they are. Thank you. Okay, so I just had another thought of the, um, positive th changes going forward that we need. Um, and I think that that has to do with weddings again. And this is a conversation that happens all the time. And that is um, the, the, the not allowing mothers and fathers of brides and grooms into their own children's weddings if they don't meet, you know, sort of the checklist requirement of the temple recommend interview. And, and that includes paying 10% of their tithing. And so the price to go to your own child's wedding is very high in a very literal sense. And that is just a really disruptive and painful experience for so many people not being allowed to yeah. go to their own child's wedding. Um, and I think that there's a really easy solution, which is the European solution, which is just separate the wedding from the ceiling. You know, just allow, you know, like allow weddings to happen out in the public <laughs> where everybody can go and, and do the religious part of the ceremony, the ceiling part separately. And, and then that way you don't have incredibly painful experiences for families who for a variety of reasons um, are not interested in or able to go to the temple. It's narcissistic and emotionally abusive that we do that and it needs to end immediately. But I've been saying that for 20 years. So it's just, it's, it's really horrific that we do that to family systems. In a church, no less, it speaks so much about family unity and, uh, uh, you know, and it's not even about being worthy. It's about being a member. I mean, there's so many mixed faith families and people who convert. And the, yeah, I had several, um, I, I even had my young siblings who couldn't attend my own wedding because they were just not of age. So very, very traumatic to separate families in such a time that should be about unity and should be about gathering your resources and gathering your community around you to celebrate this moment of union and companionship and um, marriage is hard enough without adding something ridiculous and stupid like we do in this in this realm. So I obviously have strong feelings about it. Moving on, because I know we have some time constraints, I just really like to invite each of you to um, give some closing thoughts. So um, Jimmy, would you like to go first? You brought yeah. some great perspectives, I think, from especially a male perspective to some of these gender issues. So I'm so appreciative that you were able to join us today. Yeah, me too. I appreciate the invitation. Um, I just had two. One was, I, I'm really, really hoping that when when men think about these changes, that we that we all make the connection to um, to gender. Um, and then the other thought. This is a big, massive question that I don't know how to answer. Um, there's always this like. I'm just noticing that there's a lot of skepticism and a lot of tentative, tentativeness and carefulness that the church has towards professional opinions. Mm. And it's like the final frontier, I think, to break those walls down 
And I think, I mean, more mental health, um, it seems like, is trying to do that. And uh, John DeLynn with the uh, Open Stories Foundation seems like, you know, there's a vast amount of helpful resources in all these different venues. And sometimes I think like, man, if, if we, if the church just didn't see it as such a threat, um, and that's kind of how I thought about this temple change. I thought, man, this like, okay, we're actually listening. The church is listening to people who, who, ha um, who have these negative experiences. And then the whole, but keep it to yourself. I just thought, oh, let's move past this. Let's move past the, the skepticism for professional opinion and, and thought and, and constructive criticism. Thank so, you. Yeah. Thank you. Sarah? I just want to express my gratitude for being here while also my personal approach to celebrate the beautiful and challenge the problematic. And I think that has a lot to do with people's temple experiences. And so my encouragement is to all of the clinicians who are listening to continue in honoring your clients' diverse stories and that they're all meaningful and they're all val valuable, the beautiful ones with the temple and the ones that have experienced deep wounding. And for any listeners, um, once again, claiming your story and really recognizing that your experience matters. And if these changes provide health and wellness for you, let's celebrate that. And if it's still not enough and you don't feel validated in your story, that is real and true. And um, I'm just grateful for a space for us to take the secrecy out so we can step out of shame. Thank you. Beautiful. Lisa. Um, you know, I just kind of wanted to come from a slightly different direction because I feel like I, I do have a lot of clients myself who are very faithful and who love the gospel and who are, you know, like who have really strong and beautiful testimonies. And I, um, and I feel like that, you know, in the last 10 years or so, there have become a lot of, a lot of um, resources on the internet and on Facebook and for people going through faith transition and less so for people who are experiencing family members going through faith transition, but who are not experiencing them that, that themselves. And I think that um, something that, you know, like if you happen to be one of those people and you're watching and you're like, but I've had a really beautiful experience at the temple. I'm not necessarily understanding. I'm not necessarily seeing um, or understanding where all this, you know, the pain that is happening. Um, one of the frameworks I kind of like for that is the, Id the idea of like physics and science and, and specifically of light and gravity, how they are, they can exist as a wave, but they also exist as a particle. Like you have you know, like you have photons and you have light waves and you can look at them as one way at, or the other way, but not both at the same time. Like you can't look at wave being a particle and be, or light being a particle and a wave at the exact same moment. You can measure it one way or the other. <laughs> and I feel like that, that our temple experiences can be like that, that you can have people who have beautiful, deep, powerful spiritual experiences in the temple and you can look at it through that lens and that is real. And that is, you know, like that is absolutely valid and that's looking at it as a wave. And then you can have people who have really the temple and that is also real and valid. And, um, and that doesn't necessarily mean that, that the temple itself, um, that the content or whatever is true or not true. I mean, that's a debate that people have been having forever. I'm just saying that, um, that people who have beautiful, wonderful experiences at the temple, that's also a valid experience. It doesn't, chain the uh, experience as other people have also valid thank you and I'm one of those that has had both I've had powerful beautiful experiences in the temple that have been and continue to be extremely meaningful to me and I've had experiences in the temple that have been very eye-opening and painful and, and difficult so I really love that reminder um this has been I mean, maybe I'm biased, but I think these discussions are amazing and wonderful and I love having them. <laughs> so thank you all three of you for coming and for joining us in this discussion that I think is so important at this very pivotal time in kind of Mormon history. 
I um, am more encouraged and discouraged. And, and I'm just really glad to be able to see some of these changes happen, you know, in my lifetime. So that's really wonderful. Um, again, if you are a listener of Mormon Mental Health Podcast, please consider a donation. We can't do these types of um, you know, podcasts and resources without your help. So please help me find uh, the way to fundraise and you know, spread the word and tell people about it and like our page. And um, anyway, all those things can be helpful ways for us to be able to build our community here. Please feel free to comment, tell us what you liked, what you didn't like about um, the discussion and uh, more than happy to you know, listen to your feedback because I wanna make this as best of a resource as possible for for as many people as, as are willing to have it as a resource. So um, Gary Fredrickson says, yes, they are very useful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gary, for that, for that feedback. That's wonderful. And I hope everybody has a healthy day and move forward in ways that are edifying to you. And we will see you next time. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye. Bye. Thanks for joining us today on Mormon Mental Health Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please help us and become a monthly subscriber at mormonmentalhealth.org. The goals of this podcast include education, advocacy, and the mental health and general well-being of Mormons and their families. We can't further this work without your support. Music for this episode was provided by the Lower Lights. Over last tempestuous sea Jordan compass came from me Jesus Savior pilot me unknown ways before me hiding round and treacherous show Short and compass came for me. Jesus saved me, pilot me.
fear not I 